We now go into uh, the questions uh, session of the uh, press conference. I'd like you please to introduce yourself when you uh, ask your question. And uh, uh, if there are specific questions about national circumstances, projects, and, and, and very specific issues that con do not concern the whole room, perhaps we can take those questions later on uh, in the margins of the press conference. So let's start here. Hi, Jan Strupczewski from Reuters. Could you tell us uh, what are your borrowing plans on the market uh, in 2020 compared to 2019? You gave us a range figure of 60 to 90 billion uh, in recent years. Can you be more specific about 2019 and 2020, please? And also, what will be the share of green investments uh, in 2020 compared to 2019, where you said it was 31%? What is it going to be in 2020 before it gets to half in 2025? Thank you. On the last question, it's quite obvious that after the huge success in 2019, we do not want to go back, backwards. So 31% is the, the minimum we want to achieve. But since we have committed to be at 50% by 2025, it is natural that we are targeting, targeting higher. Whether we can get there needs to be seen. I mean, you cannot turn around a tanker within, within hours or days, but I think we are on, on the right course in, in doing so. I'm, I'm convinced we will be far above the 31%, and we are well on track for the 50 in 2025. On funding, the year has started very well. We have, as always, done the first emissions immediately after the beginning of the year. That was, uh, if I look at my colleagues in the, in the Treasury, in the Financial Department, uh, and see, interpret them correctly, a very successful exercise. Um, the, 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 the funding needs are always a little bit also depending upon reflows that come in during the year. And that can sometimes bring about surprises. So I could not give you a, a, a precise figure on what we expect. But I would say that at the end of the day, uh, I would expect something around 50 billion euros, it, by the way, in all kinds of currencies. But um, this is a thumb rule based on the experience of, of the past and uh, not taking into consideration potential surprises with reflows. Any question there, then back there, and then we'll stick. Okay. Sorry, Ms. Heer, Mark Babelkorn, Voskan, Netherlands. As a question regarding the, the, the link between the EIB and the Green Deal, uh, the European Commission expects all kind of leverage uh, for the part, let's say, the EIB should, should, should uh, assist financially the Green Deal. To what extent do you think that the leverage ratios the Commission calculates with are justified? Is this really also what do you think will happen? And secondly, given the amount of money which is needed also within the Green Deal, is there a risk that the triple A status of the EIB uh, might be endangered? Thanks. Number one, uh, I've shown that the overall leverage rate was 2.88 uh, last, last year, and of course we do not ex expect to, to target lower. I think we will, since we are permanently going for efficiency gains, we can, we can target higher. Uh, I would not commit to, uh, to to a specific figure that would not be realistic. Unre would not be realistic, but going backwards uh, is not an option. Um, the second question uh, that was um, on the uh, no, the triple A. Well, I I am not a believer in in holy cows, but I'm a believer in the triple A for an institution like ours which is so dependent on the capital markets only and does not have a sovereign backing us 100%, like the national promotional banks have, for instance, are very, very good partners and friends, but uh, they have a government and a state behind themselves as guarantor. We must insist on all efforts to preserve the AAA status. And so far, I don't hear any rumors from any corner of the world, including the rating agencies, that, uh, that is being put into question. But we have a close eye on this. Um, sometimes you have to explain it to politicians. You have to explain it to politicians who say, we, as member states of the European Union, some of us, do not have AAA. 
how can you expect us to support you when you insist on your AAA status? Well, exactly because of the reason I described. We need to have the full support of the market, and that works only if we can preser preserve trust and confidence expressed in a AAA. Thank you. Zoltán Gyvai Bruxin for Hungary. President, decarbonization uh, as a first step sometimes means shifting from coal to, to natural gas, for example. Uh, I'm just wondering to what extent the EIB will be able to finance this, this kind of transition, between transition, so shifting from coal to natural gas in the framework of the just transition mechanism. I understand that the just transition fund is not fit for this, according to the proposal, but maybe the second and the third leg, uh, despite the change of your lending uh, policy, uh, maybe the EIB can contribute to this. Thank you very much. Well, if you come from a relatively dirty technology and move to natural gas, that, of course, is progress. But is it a sustainable progress? That is the big question. And I have the tendency, more and more, the, the longer I'm out of politics and the more I'm into banking, to look at this with a very professional eye. And that means that I see that we have partners in politics and in the business community who expect us to invest into projects which might make sense for the next couple of years because they provide a cleaner energy supply than with coal, for instance. But we will have them on the balance sheet for the next 30 to 40 years. And we have the very strong feeling that within 10 to 15 years we'll have to write it off. That then in the end leads to a distribution of the assets of the bank as a matter of fact, the distribution of the losses that we'll then, we'll then incur. And that is something that uh, then goes uh, not out of public budgets, where it should belong, but out of the uh, assets and the wealth of the bank, which is owned by the member states of the European Union. And that means then to redistribution of wealth between the member states of the European Union and or between the member states and the uh, community sphere. So I think we must take this from a very professional point of view and say, is it wise to invest into fossil fuels anymore? And our pro answer to this was no. We must be more ambitious in going to solutions which then will be sustainable. But of course, we do not set European energy policies. The question is, do we finance specific activities in Euro European energy policies? And there we are very cautious. Thank cautious you. and ambitious at the same time. Uh, good morning, President. Uh, Paula Tama from Politico Europe. I have a number of questions. Uh, the first is, who's replacing the UK's 16% shares in the bank? Perhaps I lost it, but uh, there was a proposal by France to have a new financing round, um, if you can expand on that. And I list my other questions too. Um, you mentioned 19.3 billion on climate action, but only 0 0.8 on climate adaptation. We know this is uh, an area where the Commission will focus on with a new climate adaptation strategy later in the year. But adaptation has, well, to my ignorant understanding, it's not a profit-making investment necessarily. So is there a challenge in uh, investing more in climate adaptation? Um, then you mentioned we are great at leveraging, but there must be something we can leverage. And in the context of the just transition mechanism, the Commission has projected what it expects the EIB to leverage in specific countries, um, namely the one which will be have to wean off from fossil fuel. Uh, is there sufficient projects, or does the bank consider there are sufficient projects on the ground already bankable in the countries that the Commission wants? Um, to tackle with this fund. And the very last one, um, the new energy lending policy. You mentioned that there won't be any investment going forward that will be contrary to the Paris Agreement because you don't want to kind of um, go against your purpose of lending 50% to climate. But there will be a plot of gas projects, probably, which will apply for funding during this year because your phase out will be from 2021 onwards. So will these projects be financed by the EIB? Will this be a case-by-case -case decision? And how will you make these decisions? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That is very uh, tough stuff uh, because, of course, we must move much more resolved towards adaptation. 
uh, and uh, we fully agree with the European Commission on that. Uh, that requires a little bit the uh, retooling or calibration, recalibration of our instruments. Uh, adaptation activities, for instance, uh, will largely take place for in communities, cities, municipalities. They will require an enormous activity level on advisory capacity, advisory services. So that is going to be a shift. By the way, all in all, I, I must say since I'm at this bank now for eight years, uh, I'm amazed how strong, how strongly the uh, part of advisory capacity or advisory activities and engineering work in the bank has grown over, the la over these eight years, even further than it was before. So that's quite amazing. There we have something to offer, which is pretty unique, because you will not find any, any big bank in the world with, with such an incredible in-house expertise in these areas. So we have a job to do there. Um, and that means we need to have uh, advisory capacity, we need to capacity building, and we need to... Uh, uh, involve grants in these activities because that, of course, cannot be done out of loans exclusively. Um, the uh, United Kingdom, um, the United Kingdom, until today, holds six, roughly 16 percent of our capital. Now, the capital of the bank is roughly 240 billion euros on our balance sheet, of which, if you count each and every cent that ever has been put into this by cash consists of not more than roughly 17 billion in cash. In addition to that, you have a two, high two-digit number of reserves because we were able to accumulate that. The member states allowed us to do so over the last 62 years. In addition to that, and that's the main thing, we have the callable capital, the contingent liability of the member states, which brings the overall capital to 240 billion. We have a gearing ratio, that is the maximum multiplier of capital on the balance sheet of the bank to projects financed. And our assets on the balance sheet are almost 600 billion euros. So 2.5 times 240 brings you there. So our lending capacity is more or less exhausted on the basis of the gearing ratio of 2.5. Sorry, a little bit technical, but it's important to understand. So when, if the Brits had withdrawn without their capital being replaced by the others, we would have had to reduce the maximum lending we can do by 40 billion times 2.5. Would have been 100 billion euros less. That would have been a disaster. I mean, not only would we have to reduce for the next few years by 50% or so, but also those member states who need us most would suffer. So I'm extremely happy and grateful that after long discussions, some say <coughs> too long discussions, the member states did what they finally decided in April 2019 to replace proportionally the British callable capital. The cash contribution of the United Kingdom is far more than peanuts, but on the other hand, a little bit over 3 billion is something that to re be repaid over 10 years in tranches we can afford. So the co key question is not the cash contribution to the United Kingdom, but the callable capital. And this has been replaced by others. In addition to that, uh, two member states have uh, indicated that they would like to increase their share in the capital, both uh, cash and uh, callable capital. That is uh, Romania and Poland. Uh, and in addition to that, there are other member states thinking about small adjustments of their capital share in the bank because over the decades, the relative weight of the member states in the bank has changed and that should be a little bit better reflected in the capital. So if the member states are ready to do so, we are happy about it. But the big question that uh, you ended with, the idea of Emmanuel Macron, the French president, uh, should EIB go for a uh, real capital increase, which we haven't had for many, many years, as a matter of fact, almost seven years now. That is something that a president of a bank loves to hear. But uh, we, we are not demandeurs here. What I foresee is that the member states will raise their ambitions vis-a-vis -vis the use of EIB as an instrument, in particular in view of the fact that the EU budget will not 
explode or develop in the dimension that the European Commission might dream of. And if that happens, the question will even be more relevant. Can EIB step in with financial instruments in order to compensate for this? If that is the case, if that is the case, and it must be the wish of the member states, then, of course, we would have to ask them to contribute by a capital injection. The main part of this capital injection would not have to be cash, because as I outlined before, the cash basis on which the bank works is extremely limited. What is necessary is the strengthened shareholder support expressed by the callable capital, the contingent liability, and that would have to be increased considerably. So uh, we, there is no worry for EU budgets, for member states' budgets, because uh, we don't expect them to put in much cash, but if they want us to do more, then we, they need to give us the backing via callable capital. Yeah, the, the projects on the just transition, uh, I don't have the feeling that there are enough projects, but that's a weakness already before the just transition fund. We must put more effort in the development and design of good, sustainable projects. And that's where we are good. One of, by the way, when we praise Jean-Claude Juncker for the Juncker plan, unfortunately this is reduced to the terrible word FC all the time. The Juncker plan consisted of three elements. The one was the, the, the guarantee facility, which, by the way, is not a fund, but a guarantee facility. The flaw from the beginning. Secondly, it consisted on a simplification and streamlining of regulation in the European Union. That's what Mr. Timmermans has been working on very, very strongly over the last five years, and that job is not done yet. And the third issue was the setting up of the European Advisory Hub, together European Commission and EIB. And this has strengthened our advisory capacity even further, and this will need to be the case in the next years as well. We need to strengthen the advisory capacity and the project shaping capacity of the EU and the EU Bank. It's okay. Uh, Rainer Lückehus, Energate, Germany. Um, when will you have worked out uh, the taxonomy for uh, sustainable finance? Well, that work is in progress uh, very successfully. I must say that uh, we strongly support the European Commission on, on their ambition. When we issued the first green bonds in 2007, our colleagues, one of them is sitting here in the second row, uh, were the ones who supported the idea of rules for the emission of green bonds from the beginning. We led the green bond principle working group because it was obvious from the beginning, and we, there were allegations all over from the beginning, that people would just take a piece of white paper, paint it green, and sell it then as a green bond without proving, without out delivering evidence that the project finance with these bonds have a climatic or environmental impact. So you, we needed rules. That worked quite well with, the, with this uh, green bond principles group. We need the same thing but on a higher level and with more binding capacity on the European and, if possible, global level. This is why I strongly support the work of... Uh, Vice President Dombrovskis and others in the European Commission to arrive at the taxonomy. The bad thing, and Jean-Claude Juncker plays with that word all the time, that it has the word tax in it, and that's always negative, but take it as from the Greek roots, then tax leads you not to taxes, but to order. There must be order in the green market and the sustainability awareness bonds markets. Otherwise, we undermine the credibility of the instruments that we bring to the market. And as a matter of fact, we have expanded the idea of the green bonds now. Uh, when I came to the bank, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, was the first to ask me whether the obvious success of the green bonds could not be replicated with what then was later named Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, Antonio Gutierrez, the present Secretary General of the United Nations, continues to put pressure on us on this, and we have... <coughs> issued the first sustainability awareness bonds uh, one and a half years ago. The first um, big issuance was on a bond that was specifically targeted to finance water projects. Water <coughs> projects are 
rather favorable for marketing and to even purchase and sales and all this. Stuff. So water, water was the first sector we approached, and we are now approaching the next two SDGs, and that is health and education. Uh, and on all these fronts, we need to make sure that we don't see greenwashing or green cheating or the comparable f color for health and, and uh, education. Uh, and uh, this taxonomy thing, that is always something we think of in the context of big projects, big actors, strong actors, but it's particularly important for SMEs. SMEs must know exactly what is expected from them and what we expect from them, from their projects, if they are, so to speak, cleared in terms of the taxonomy. So this is an example where you can see that all our policy objectives that we pursue, financing of small companies, cohesion, <coughs> innovation, climate, go hand in hand. And we must get away from the idea that there is a conflict of, of, of uh, objectives on this. These objectives must be pursued together. But uh, I think it would, on the SME side, make sense if I could ask my colleagues from EIF, Maria Leander or Alain Godard, to, to have a word on this because they are the heroes on the SME business. Thank you, President. Uh, I'd like indeed to, uh, to intervene and thank you again for inviting me for my first uh, contribution uh, here today. Um, SMEs are indeed very key, I mean, in achieving the, uh, the Green Deal, actually, um, as it represents, as we know, more about 90% uh, of the economy. So the key challenge when it comes to uh, taxonomy will be indeed to develop quite quickly, actually, um, clear uh, guidelines in order to reflect how green would be the SMEs and how they will contribute into the uh, objective of, of the Green Deal. Maybe just to remind also that, uh, uh, as the President mentioned, that uh, SMEs are, are key. I mean, e EIF is financing about 1.5 million of SMEs in Europe. This is extremely important also from a data point of view, because uh, they are very relevant, uh, not only from a, 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 let's say, Green Deal point of view, but also from other sectors. Thank you. As a matter of fact, we only have just begun to exploit the wealth of this database. This is unique. And uh, if you combine that with latest technologies, if the develop of the, with the development of artificial intelligence and all these things, put the dots together and you arrive in a different world. So this is, be, this is going to be very, very exciting over the next 12, 12 months to, to observe. I just realized that I forgot to answer one question that uh, the, the lady from Politico asked about uh, the, the gas projects. Well, when we took our decision, which was the case after a very long and controversial discussion in council and, of course, reflected in the board of directors of the bank, we made it crystal clear that we honor the obligations that we have undertaken uh, with partners for the next years. So what has been decided and has been signed will be honored and what is in the pipeline. And people had to rely upon us that they can <coughs> Uh, submit until the end of this very year, we will honor that as well. So uh, we will not run away from, from obligations that we have, but we will close the chapter after that. So projects of common interest that uh, had been identified and discussed with us before, uh, of course, will be honored. Frank Hütten from the German Transport Paper. In one of your papers, you are saying uh, there are plans to update your lending policy on transport. Could you elaborate a bit on that? In which direction are you thinking there? We are entering a very fundamental debate on this, a uh, broad debate, fundamental, that sounds so uh, revolutionary. Um, I think we need to organize consistency with our different policies. And uh, the consistency cannot be achieved by saying you have adopted a new energy lending policy and therefore, for instance, air travel is out of scope. That is not the question. The question is what kind of air traffic, for instance, will be available for EIB financing also in the future. Uh, that is just one example. But transport will be in the focus of our activities over the next years. Uh, we, that means if we set up a policy 
then policy setting up of a policy for us means to to present a very comprehensive paper, strategic paper, and that needs to be submitted to public consultation. And a public consultation of this kind takes a year. The public consultation on the new energy lending policy took far more than a year. And the same will be the case with, with uh, the transport policy. But I think it's time to engage in this. Uh, and I, I do not want to preempt the outcome. But uh, we also, that's the only thing I would put to it from the personal point of view, also in transportation, we must look more at the innovative part of it and not at the part that has, at the end of the day, something to do with uh, prohibitions or permissions. Uh, we have to give the market a chance to organize it in a technologically ambitious way. We're running out of time. Maybe time for a couple more questions. Yeah, here. Yeah, there and then here. Thank you very much. It's uh, Andreas Wallstad from Interfax. Um, just to clarify, if I understood you correctly, so gas projects can continue to apply for funding until the end of 2021. And the second question is, what are your thoughts on carbon capture uh, technologies, such as uh, carbon capture and storage and, and use and so on? Thank you. On the, on the, on the gas projects, uh, I said, Things that are in the pipeline and are already in discussion with us, we will honor. But uh, don't come at the idea of, of coming with completely new stuff. Uh, that is over. Um, then on um, um, uh, CCS, uh, well, of course, that's, that's an interesting and, and, and important technology. Um, it, I think we will arrive at a couple of new deliberations which in the black and white world seem to disappear. For instance, when we talk about uh, electric mobility, electromobility, we have the tendency to go blind to all other developments, now into electromobility, seeing very well that other technologies might come up quickly. I take also in the future hydrogen extremely serious, and I think there will be the development of huge markets. In this context, the need for CCS might even increase. And if that brings us into progress on the use of primary resources, then it could be a very good possibility for, in my view. I'm not the engineer on this. You can bring it together with our specialists on this. But what I plead in this context, being only a humble economist and not an engineer or a natural scientist, is let's develop these spheres technologically open-minded and not believe that we from basically the banking or the political world can set the technological trends. They will come elsewhere. And therefore, please don't put all eggs into one basket. Uh, Nawab Khan from the Kuwait News Agency. Uh, besides Africa, uh, which other regions are you thinking of investing beyond the EU and in what projects in this year? Thank you. We are practically active around the world. Africa is a special focus. There is no doubt about that. And this has been underlined also by the position of the European Council uh, in the last couple of years. The expectation there is, is enormous. The quantum leaps in development, the frog leap development in Africa that is possible is breathtaking. So uh, I'm, I must say every time I return from Africa, I'm, I'm full of enthusiasm and new ideas and uh, believe that uh, we can make much more of the euro by going there than sometimes to our own neighborhood here. Uh, the second point is, of course, uh, we are a global institution. Uh, I think the only continent where we only have an office but no, no activity is Australia. But uh, otherwise, we, and in Oceania, we are very active. But we are, for instance, uh, very active also in, in the Middle East and the, uh, in the more or less European neighborhood, East and South. Uh, the Middle East is, uh, together with Africa, our closest neighbor, and we are well advised to, to be helpful there. The Eastern neighborhood of the European Union anyway, this is still the part of the transformation process after 
the fall of the Berlin Wall that needs to be addressed. So that is going to be a strong point of us as well. But then uh, there is one area which we don't talk about enough, and that is our partnership with Latin America. I must say that uh, Latin America is uh, our oldest and uh, sometimes neglected partner in the world. And there are so many things we have together with Latin America, so many interests. And when we focus it on some spheres where our interests really are not only compatible but congruent, like climate change, you can have the biggest impact on reduction of CO2 emissions and, and other climate effects, for instance, via reforestation in, in Latin America. Carbon cap capture of the, of the natural way, of, of the natural kind. So we, we have huge projects of, uh, in this region, in the area, climate and energy efficiency in Latin America as well. And for our entire business outside the European Union, it holds true that while inside the European Union we have arrived at 31% of climate action now, as I outlined before, outside the European Union we are moving between 60 and 70% already. And this will rather increase than decrease. And member states sometimes tell us the euro spent on climate action in Africa, Latin America, or Asia has a higher impact than the same euro is spent in Europe. So we must think global when we think about climate. And that uh, includes uh, really... Yeah. One, last, one, sorry. one last question. Hajo Friedrich, Deutsche Handwerkszeitung. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I miss one topic, the um, ongoing low interest policy of the ECB. What does it mean for your bank if interest rates don't play any longer the role they did in, in the past. And because all, a lot of private uh, clients of banks in Germany, for instance, they are confronted also with negative uh, interest rates. What does it mean? What, how do you comment on this? Has, can the ECB continue this uh, Draghi policy or is this the end of an uh, economic model we, we, you learned at the University of Cologne when you studied economy? I even taught that at the University of Cologne, so uh, I'm very sensitive to that. Um, I have always followed one rule that since I have entered politics in 1987, and that is from the political sidelines, I do not comment monetary policy. I take it too seriously. As you know, my, my research activity has been exactly in that field, so I have the permanent temptation to, to comment on this and maybe even have an impact, and I think it would not be fair. I believe that, and this is a little bit contra to, in contrast to the, the public sentiment that is sometimes artificially produced in our own country, it's unfair vis-a-vis -vis the great success that Draghi has had. Without his courageous stance 10 years ago, we would not have moved out of that existential crisis at that time. That does not change the fact that in my view, the eternalization of zero interest rates or even negative interest rates, in my view, will not be possible. So you have to try to move out of this in order to be able to have a monetary policy tool in your hand again. But we have seen with the Fed how difficult that was. The Fed has tried to get out of it for the last three years. And so far, practically, they have failed. They have made minimal steps forward. So we have to accompany the process. We have to try to be co constructive on this. But some people play with fire when they believe by simply setting up the interest rate at 2% or 3% in the European Union, we would solve the problem. The first thing we would produce is lots of bankruptcies of uh, public entities and of corporates. Therefore, it is a move with most precise fine-tuning necessary over many years, and I think the process will last long. And I'm going to be the last one to give advice to my friend Christine Lagarde how she should do it. Uh, I don't envy her for that task. Thank you very much, President. This concludes the press conference. You have all uh, uh, the material and the figures and the key figures and, and plenty more available online and in hard copy out, out here. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Have a great day.